Strong Enough merch is now available. Go to strongenoughpod.com and see all the things that you can get to show your strong enough pride, as well as remind people and yourself that you are strong enough and you are worth it. Welcome to the Strong Enough Podcast, where we talk about the challenges and celebrate the triumphs of people from all walks of life. I'm your host, Claudia. Today's guest is going to talk about going through many different traumas throughout her life. And instead of becoming jaded and negative, she decided to look at these as something that happened to her and not because of her. And due to that, she's been able to turn those negatives into positive stories that fuel her life. Please help me welcome Vivica Spinelli. You know, we recently met and I absolutely loved your energy. And I felt like you had so many stories to tell and you had so much life experience, but it didn't, it hadn't jaded you. And that's one of the things that I really love about you. So how did you get to that place? Well, I, I got to that place by just, not letting my outer world dictate my inner world. So I always kind of knew myself. I knew I was different than everyone around me, everybody in my family. And I just really wasn't really that social when I was younger. So I had a lot of time to know myself. And the things that happened outside of me gave me perspective. They, I looked at them from inside myself. And I always told myself they were outside of me. I don't know what I did or what I brought or what that person is going through. So like, even when I was like, I guess I'm an old soul. And I, and what comes with that is just the ability to differentiate and separate the things that happen to you versus who you are. So I just kind of was a spectator, even though it was happening to me, I was just spectating. I guess I don't, if, if that makes sense. If that... No, that makes perfect sense to me. And I wish that other people had that same perspective because when we go through trauma, it is easy to get wrapped up in that victim mentality of why did this happen to me? Why me? What did I do to deserve this? And and sometimes that can be really hard to overcome. Absolutely. And I've been there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I didn't live this life where I was like, oh, that, you know, you know, I, I there was a a very rock bottom hard spot that I was in multiple times in my life and I had to stop and think how you know where do I want to be and sometimes what you know what happened to that person because see the thing with trauma is that once you're traumatized and this is what I've learned you tend to traumatize other people on accident right and so people who lash out at you and you're like I didn't even breathe yet. Uh That's a them thing. And my heart would like melt for them. You know, and did I feel put upon? Absolutely. But it's just like, how does it benefit me to wallow it? I've never been a wallower. um, And I think it's because I didn't really know how to wallow. I just always move forward. You know, like that. What was that cartoon um, where it was just, you have to keep moving forward. Uh And so I always did. I mean, mistakes keep moving forward. I did stupid stuff. I mean, we all do, right? Right. But I think it's just, what, where do I want to go? I focus more on the future than the past. Uh And I didn't want to live in that. It hurt. So I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be in that moment. And that got me through my entire life. And I think this generation, as backwards as it sounds, is more traumatized than we were because they're not actually dealing with 
the type of trauma. They're dealing with self-inflicted trauma Mm -hmm. through their social media reliance and their inability to handle basic events and occurrences that happen. Right. Well, and they don't. Because we all sheltered, like not our generation, but the generation that Mm -hmm. we kind of came after us. They're like anti-spanking, anti-discipline, anti-saying no, like Mm -hmm. anti, and I hate to say this in a a weird way, but I have no better way to say it as a parent, but like anti-fear instilling. Right. Right. Like, so all of those things, I mean, there's a certain point where it's no longer sheltering. It's more of a disability they're pouring on their children. I just think that... Mm -hmm. In that respect, this generation is way more traumatized than we are because they don't know how to come back. So what they're being taught and what parents are teaching their kids a lot of times is that mm, we're not going to give you the consequence for doing that that bad thing, that wrong thing, because there are things you should not do. Right, right. But like if you touch the stove and you didn't feel pain, you would just keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so that's what's going on with, with this trauma in this generation with these kids who, you know, they're not, they're traumatizing themselves in a way because they don't have the toolbox mm-hmm. on either side of that. You know, it's like having a doorknob that's not screwed in all the way. It still kind of works. Mm-hmm but it's not protecting you from anything. Right. And then when they go out in the real world, it's like, oh my God. Oh, I, I, you know, I talk this way to just anybody and I got punched in the face. And, and not saying people deserve to get, some people do deserve to get punched in the face Yeah, I agree. Um, to be honest, but Right. They they don't accept that, like, maybe my actions contributed to the situation. <laughs> exactly. They it's the blame game mm-hmm. and it's everybody's wrong and I'm right. It's a very this, if I dare say so, um, is a very narcissistic generation. Yes. Yes. And it's. It, it, and seriously, they don't even know. They don't even know because they, they weren't taught that that was a behavior that's unacceptable. So, I mean, it's been a real flip. You know, when I was a kid, mm-hmm. it was like I had the fear, forget the fear of God. I had the fear of my parents. Right. Oh. Disappointment. Or, you know, like my dad had this rule. Oh. If you tell me what you did wrong when I get home, your punishment will be less. You're, you're still getting punished, but it's not going to be as harsh, right? You might stand in the corner instead of, you know, whatever. So, I mean, but I am literally okay. I turned out okay. And I can handle if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I don't pull out a gun. <laughs> right, right. And uh, there was this look that my mom would get on her face. Oh, terrifying. <laughs> terrifying we we, you and i would probably be dead right oh it was the word like i did not want to see that face and god forbid i tell either of my parents f you no i mean if there were five walls lined up i would have went through all of them and out of the house yeah we did not talk that way to our parents and you know um because of the the look we get the look if we the look would happen. Right. But we didn't even do the because the that was not a thing. No, no. It was just the look and then the progression. And then the tail between the legs and, and the head down and okay, yes, right. ma'am. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Can gosh. I do the dishes now? <laughs> I mean, what's gonna fix it though? You know, like how do we revert this entire generation? Well, First, we have to have our leaders take responsibility for their actions. We're far removed from the Jackie Kennedy era, Mm -hmm. which was where women were poised and did not degrade themselves publicly to get attention. 
if I could say it like that. So I think when our leadership comes back around to the appearance of authority, then the respect will start to happen and things will start to fall in line. But that could be four generations from now with the way we're going. I mean, you know, that's that's about all I could say about all that. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, we, it, the people you look up to, if they're misbehaving, then that promotes misbehavior. And with the laws that we have in place right now in different parts of the country, it only promotes the bad behavior. Do you think it will take a strong female leader to right the ship or can the right man do it? Or does it even matter? I don't think it's a, a, a gender, a female or male, uh, that will make a difference as much as a firm, strong, compassionate leader. Um, someone that has common sense in the deepest sense of that, uh, topic, uh, because like, I feel like even when you go to the doctor, let's just say you break your arm, no, you break your, you break your ankle, right? And the ankle doctor takes an x-ray. Oh, your ankle's broken. Oh. My knee hurts. Well, you got to see the knee doctor for that. Like, are the ankle and the knee not connected? And does one not affect the other? So I have one doctor who is incredible for my son. Um, he is an uh, orthopedic doctor who specializes in concussion. And um, he will not necessarily diagnose a concussion when there's a neck or back trauma until the neck or back trauma is relieved a little bit. He said there was this one hockey player. I can't for my life remember the hockey player's name. But he got run into the boards and his head and neck hit the boards first. And what happened was he was cleared from the concussion. He went through the return to play. And he was still having the headaches and stuff. And what they found after like months of this back and forth was that it was it was a neck injury and a back injury that was causing these headaches. So we need someone who's going to look at the holistic, the whole picture and, and the holistic um, vibe of society. You know, it's you can't just focus in on, you know, one body part. That's like saying you're blind because your eyes are bad and ignoring the fact that someone has diabetes. Right. You know, and that's where we are right now. We're ignoring the diabetes and we're treating the blindness as if it's not connected to any. And we're so fragmented as a society right now. All of, I mean, as human beings um, in every way possible that we're missing the forest for a tree. So I think until we get a little bit, I mean, more people, more people like us, more people who see kind of more of a, a, an aerial view, an area view of, of the world. Um, until we are more connected, I don't think there's going to be major changes. But we have to get stronger and get to know people one-on-one -on -one more. Mm -hmm. You know, forget about all these factions in our society. There's no, it's ridiculous. Like, are you a nice person or are you not a nice person? And then the nice people get to know each other and the differences that they have. Like you have things you're strong at and I have things I'm strong at. Let's work together. And so saying, oh, you're not like me. Get away from me. Ooh. So I think. We need to come together more. More people need to find each other. And I think that is happening right now. Because people are just getting sick and tired of the drama. 
Well, it's even like you said earlier, like, oh, I don't want to talk about politics because we have learned in the last several years that it's so divisive at this point in time and that it will start an argument and people, not every person, but so many people now are unwilling to hear another side. Even if they disagree, they're unwilling to even listen and then say, you know what? I heard what you said. Uh, I still disagree respectfully. Like we can't even do that anymore with so many people. It's just, well, if you don't think like I think you're wrong and you're stupid and I don't want anything to do with you. And that's really and frustrating. Violent. Right. It's turned into violence so quickly. And, you know, I have a friend for 20 plus years. Okay. Me and her, you know, we're like two peas in a pod. We could talk five years later and pick up right where we left off, laugh, giggle, and we are opposite in political views. However, when I talk to her and I listen, part of this is we're a non-listening society, unless we like what we hear. It's like that song you're used to and you're irritated, so you don't want to listen to a new song. You want to listen to the same song that you know uh, because everything else frustrates you. It's, it's like that. And me and my girlfriend, like I said, we have completely different views. And she's even told me who not to vote for and asked me to promise her I wouldn't vote for certain people. And I just, I listen to her perspective and I do gain something every time. Well, why should I not vote for this person? Maybe there's something that you know that I don't know. And we've lost that as a society for the most part. What do you think about... All of this as it relates to violence and not just violence against people that we don't know, but violence against people that we do know. So do you think this kind of whole attitude of the generations that are coming now has caused an increase in domestic violence or sex crimes because there's a there's a larger lack of respect for other people? Absolutely. I mean, I see I see it daily each ripple is a generation you know of people and ironically when a ripple in the middle of the ocean reaches the shore it's still a wave and and, and still can cause damage and i think you know 400 years ago we're still suffering from the ripple effects that have been then I can't imagine 400 years from now what it's going to look like if there's not a change, a, a, a storytelling modification of some sort. You know, we all create our own story. Let's create a positive one. Why are we all, why are people so focused on the negative? I mean, the military was a big part of my life. It did a lot in my life to make me who I am today. Uh, good, bad, ugly, whatever. It, you know, it really gave me the fortitude. And I guess that's the word I could use that we lack in, in our generation today. There's no fortitude. Oh, uh, I don't like this teacher. I'm just going to quit school. That's too hard. I don't want to do that. Right. You know, um, I don't have the time to deal with that. I'm just going to do what feels good, which is okay. But in life, in reality, things don't feel good. Right. Like getting up in the morning if you're not a morning person. Not my favorite. Not mine either. I'm not a morning and I don't like the cold, but I take cold showers now. Um, <laughs> as a part of my my new thing I'm doing. But, you know, being uncomfortable creates fortitude, creates drive. Mm -hmm. And it's like, honestly, I've had instill into my kids because I can't afford to take care of them for the rest of their life. Nor should you. <laughs> Nor should you. You know, like I'm trying to raise men. I, w I want you to talk a little bit more about the negative story versus the positive story, because 
you're right. We, I feel like as a society, uh, are so quick to go to the negative. And we were talking about that earlier, you know, where it was like, oh, I get this text message. So I immediately wonder, what did I do wrong? How have I screwed up? Mm -hmm. And and we're all so quick to do that or we're so quick to frame things in the negative when we could just as easily write that positive story. So what have you done to make that switch and what has it done to change your life? Well, I think growing up. And I know I can't really attribute this to my parents parenting skills. I mean, fortitude, they definitely instilled in my life. And I thought I was going to die if I told a lie because my dad was not. Lies just didn't fly. Period. I like that as a catchphrase. Lies don't fly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and so I think that I grew up with the mindset and and I think this, uh, I can't attribute this to my father. I was his miracle baby. So that's what he used to call me. Um, And he would bounce me on his knee and he would say, you can be anything in the world you want to be. And that gave me, I'm a very free spirit. I probably was born a free spirit. Um, I get get a giggle out of that. Um, But, you know, and I feel like that freedom with the discipline created the ability to frame things a little bit differently. I guess one of the experiences it is I was deathly afraid to climb a tree when I was little. Now I was a tomboy, okay? So my dad put me in this tree. And it was probably, well, my dad was 6'4", so it's just probably seven feet up in the tree. And I'm six years old. And today this would be abuse. But back when I was a kid, it was like normal. So he stuck me in the tree. And as he was walking away, because he knew I was afraid of heights and I was afraid of the tree, he said, dinner's almost ready. You can eat when you get out of the tree. And he walked in the house and I sat there and I I remember sitting on that limb panicking I was like looking down looking around like how do I get out of this tree and then I I thought what's the worst that could happen like I'm hungry I want that dinner (laughs) right and I jumped out of the tree and that was my favorite pastime was climbing that tree as high as I could and jumping out of it and that's what we lack right now So that gave me, I don't know, that was a pivoting moment. I know I was only six years old. How could that be a pivoting moment? Well, at six, I didn't know that. But now I look at it and I'm like, well, that's how I've looked at everything in my life. What is the worst that could happen if I make this decision? If I ask for this opportunity or I, you know, oh, if I... If I smoke that or I try that or whatever, what's the worst that can happen? And I would weigh it. So I've had pretty much an anti-drug lifestyle because I've actually learned by watching other people screw up their lives um, and do things that adversely affected them, like get arrested. And so knock on wood, I haven't ever been arrested. I just weigh it like that. And I've taught my kids to do the same thing. And I've taught other people's kids the same. I've asked the question when they have fear, which A friend of mine told me an acronym for fear is false evidence appears real. So, you know, anytime, especially with young athletes, I'm like, what do you lose if you try out for the best team on Long Island? You lose an hour of your time. You're not in any worse position when you got there after you leave. Right? So that's. From the time I was a little girl, my whole perspective. What is the worst thing that could happen to me if I make this decision? And so I've jumped off of not literal cliffs, but some cliffs in my life. And it's worked out or it hasn't, but I've taken what I've learned and used it in every aspect of my life. 
You know, how is it going to affect me if I go through my day pissed off about this guy who just cut me off and almost wrecked my car? Well, did he wreck my car? No. Was it annoying? Yes. Do, does he deserve to be throat punched? In my head, yes. Do I throat punch him? No. So, um, yeah, I just, I've went my whole life with what's the worst that can happen. And, and I also, one of the things that got, that's gotten me through a lot of my trauma and kept me focused, because I think you can get really diverted and women have this diffuse awareness where we tackle like 15 things, a million things, whatever it is at a time, and we get lost in it. Oh my God, where are my keys? <laughs> I was just in this, in the middle of all this stuff, but where are my keys? Um, and I think the biggest thing that's helped me keep my focus in life toward a goal is just thinking of myself from five years from now or whatever. Like, what would my future self, like, this is a big one because I'm not a morning person and it's cold in New York and pretty much I'm in Massachusetts right now in a hotel. It snowed yesterday. That was painful. Um, painfully cold. I walked outside. I'm like, oh, yeah, there goes my hair. Um, but when I wake up in the morning at 4.30 to go to the gym to meet this goal I have, the first thing I say is, oh, I don't want to get up. And then the second thing I say is, I just I tell myself what I have to do. Oh, I have to get a shower. Oh, I got to make my pre-workout. Oh, I got to do this. And then I say, I don't feel like it. And then I say, to myself, what would next week Vivica say to me now? Like how, if I do this and I reach my goal, the person that is at the end of the goal will thank me. So I thank myself from that person for doing this hard thing that I have to do or moving on or moving past or not getting stuck in a trauma. Okay, well, what do I have to do next to get where I need to go? It's like, you know, if you get in your car, I love this because Mike Dooley said this best in The Secret. You can tell the universe what you want. It's like driving a car. You know, you put the address in, in the GPS and It'll show you where the destination is and three or four routes to get there. And like he said, but if you don't start the car, you're not getting there. So I took that little bit and I, I, I put it in my head and I'm like, well, if I just get up and go to the gym, I can make the decision whether I want to work out. And just getting there, getting out of bed. You know, and that's how I've lived my entire life. Just doing the hard thing. And then it's not so hard. You know, or facing a trauma. Like a rape. And, you know, uh, which, as I said, you know, I've been through that multiple times. And um, not the easiest thing to get past. You're angry. It's like the grieving process that you go through because you lost a part of yourself. A part of you dies when some when a trauma hits you, and it, it it's a real trauma. So you go through this grieving process, and you're angry out of the box. And then you're like, well, "What did I do to deserve this? What did I do to bring this on myself?" And that's our generation talking. Because the first thing when you go to report a rape back in my day, you know, when I was growing up, when I was, you know, 15, 16 year old girl was, well, what did you do? What were you wearing? How did you bring this on yourself? How did you provoke that man? And so that's where my mind would always go. And then after that, it was anger again. So it's a different grieving process because there's a lot of anger. Every, every other, every other transition is angry, um, or at least it was for me. Um, but yeah, and I, I, t I would tell myself, okay, I don't want to deal with this right now, but how can I be productive 
to just be in a better place regardless, you know? And when I had my boys, it was like, well, I have to be a person for them. And the respect that I had this trauma, but how can I raise my boys to respect women to not bring on trauma? And when I lived in California, you want to know in Starbucks, the funniest thing happened because I'm old school. My kids, I'm military. So yeah, my kids were disciplined and they were doing on your back, on your belly, on your feet, and they were doing push-ups, but they really hated on the back, on the belly, on your feet. So that sucked for them and they hated it. And they were like little kids and they would do it and I would make them do it in public because that's discipline. Oh God, that's really uncomfortable. I don't want to do that again. And we were at Starbucks one day and my son was having a fit because kids have fits. And he said something to me and he hit me with his little bitty fist. Right, didn't hurt. I mean, it was almost giggle worthy. And I mean, even though he's strong, it's like, but you can't do that in front of your kids. And there was this man sitting having his coffee and scone or whatever. And I grabbed my son's hand when he went to hit me. I caught it. And I said, You will not hit women, especially your mother. And the guy almost got out of his chair and he said, don't talk to your son that way. And I said, that's none of your business. I said, but clearly you must hit women or, or condone it to speak up against that message. And we walked away. Um, but from the very time they were little, because of every trauma that I ever been, I've ever been through, I can't change the men who beat me up or raped me or, but I can make sure that my boys know how to treat a woman and, and no boundaries. And I think in, in that I healed a lot because I'm raising two young men who respect women that For the most part, they will respect women until women become how do I say this? It's hard to respect a woman who doesn't respect herself. And I would say that's true for everybody. Right. A person. But right. In general. Hundred percent. Um, you know, and I just teach my kids to avoid those women. And I remember right. the biggest thing, you know, I'm from the South. So it's a different world in the South. There, there is, there are ladies and gentlemen, um, sirs and ma'ams. Exactly. And in the military, sir and ma'am is a thing, and should be a thing. I don't know what that crazy thing I read was, where you don't call a man sir. No, my kids say yes, ma'am and sir. Period. I sir and ma'am everybody still. Yes, and it's respect. And one of the biggest things, like I told my, my boys, you know, because I'm from the South and I'm raising gentlemen. And I said, you know, we got in this conversation. My, my son started like, girls started liking him and whatever. And I was like, oh, mom, you know, opening the door for, you know, they've always opened the door for everyone. Ever since they were little, we would be stuck at the movie theater because they were holding the door open for the entire crowd going out and then the entire crowd going in. Um, and I, just, you know, develop patience, right? Because that's what I taught them to do. I said, you hold the door open for women, children, men with babies, um, pretty much everybody except like old people, like, you know, and I kind of, that's what I taught them. And my son came in, well, she doesn't like me to open the door for her. And I was like, look, it's very simple, son. You don't hold the door for a woman because she can't do it. Because women are more than capable of doing everything a man can do for the most part uh, on their own. 
you hold the door open for a woman that you like or a girl that you like because you, out of respect. Not out of her deficiency as a woman because women aren't deficient. I said, out of respect. Because any woman who respects herself will allow you to respect her. But if you're respecting a woman who has made it obvious and put up a fight to not be respected, then she's got a lot of things to work on. And maybe that's not where you need to be. You know? Do you think it's harder right now to raise your sons in the way that you want to raise them because you have so many competing influences in the form of social media and other generations of people who maybe don't have respect or don't have that sense of responsibility. Do you feel like that makes it even harder? Absolutely. I mean, my older son, he is very mellow. My older son is the opposite of my younger son. My younger son is an athlete, um, looks literally like my father. Um, both my boys are handsome young men, but my younger one has this charisma about him that draws people in. You don't know how many times I've heard from my younger one, mom, it's not when you were growing up. You don't understand. That doesn't mean that anymore. Or, you know, mom, social media is whatever. And it does, it makes it very hard because what social media, I, my opinion, has done has normalized behaviors like drugs and alcohol. And it actually opened the, like, like marijuana used to be the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. Social media is the gateway drug to everything good and bad that can, you can get access to. I mean, when we were younger, you know, we didn't have the access to the things the kids have access to today. And things were taboo. Oh, oh fake ID. Ooh, ooh. Now it's like, oh, yeah. This is going to be so terrible. This is. Melvin got me mine, you know, like regular, you know, neighborhood. You know, right. The guy down the street. Guy. Yeah, guy down the neighbor. That's like, you know, and, and not for anything. This appearance thing is hilarious. They literally, like some of these parents know their kids smokes pot, know their kids drink. And then when you're promoting a different lifestyle for your family, it it's like, I don't even know how to say this, but it's mind boggling. That they act like they don't know or that they're too good. Like they're, they're just, oh, my kid would never do that. And guess who their kid calls? Your kid, because your kid has a mom who cares mm -hmm. and is paying attention. You know, and they're either so far removed from parenting or they just... They're doing the same behaviors and there's nothing wrong with it. There's no consequence. And so their kid doesn't get that scholarship at, you know, that prestigious university that, you know, whatever. Because they failed out of school or, or, or shoots up a school. Well, did you not see that this kid was bullied for 10 years? And the school sided with the bully? I mean, come on, let's just call it what it is. That's what mm -hmm. happened. Right. You know, did the parents not realize that the bullying wouldn't just go away? My kids were bullied, but I was the parent everybody hated because I was like, do you see that? <laughs> what are you going to do? Don't, you know, tell me the other kid. I don't care about the other kid. The other kid's a bully. And don't victimize my, my, like, and I hate to use the word victim, but, you know, when someone suffers a trauma, they're not necessarily a victim. They're only a victim when they're re-victimized by being told of the bad guy. That's when they're a victim. In my opinion. 
getting back to your question about how social media and how difficult it is to raise kids, I think the biggest thing is, is my son has learned if he does something that I don't approve of, uh, he waits a couple days to tell me. That way I don't get as mad. You know, but both my kids are very honest with me. And I think it's just because I acknowledge that they're human beings and mistakes are necessary to build your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. If you never try something like I'm going to put my kids out in the world and I'm going to say. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. There's no consequence for your action. And then I'm going to put them at, in New York City in the world. And they're going to make a comment to some random person. And like I said, get punched in the face. Or worse. And their face is fractured. Or worse. Let's tattoo chat for a minute. Um, you, you talked about them earlier. And you don't have tattoos, I know. Well, um, I, I realize I kind of do, but I didn't think about it at the time. But okay. I don't have any artistic tattoos. I have nanoblading. Okay. Okay. So I, I have a lot of tattoos, as you know, um, it is snowing here today and I'm in a hoodie, so you can't see them. Um, I do judge people with face and neck tattoos. I will say that. I know we said we weren't supposed to judge people. Um, but I do, and I can admit that. Um, if I see a face tattoo, I'm like, mm, you well, are probably a criminal, um, or should be like, but that's me. Anyway, um, it's also experience. It, right. It, exactly. Because the people I've come across in life with face tattoos generally are criminals. But if you were going to get an artistic tattoo, what would you get? Where would you put it? So, um, actually, when I was in the Navy, I went in to be an intelligence specialist. And obviously in the Navy, they have symbols for every job you would do. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never really shared this, but I, before they changed my rate for the needs of the Navy, um, I was going to get that symbol on my pubic bone. Oh, okay. Where no one would have seen it except someone very special. Um, however, now, if I were to get a tattoo, which is funny that, that this conversation is, is happening because I bought semi-permanent tattoos mm -hmm. that last about a month. Right. And I've been on the fence about where would I put it? What would I do? And I think... Uh, it's hard, right? But I think the eye of Horus would be one of the things that uh, I would like um, if I were to get one. Um, my son and I had this conversation recently because the person I told you about that uh, was an alcoholic was one of a significant other of mine. Mm -hmm. And he had a tattoo on his shoulder. And my son was talking to me about if he got a tattoo, he would want to honor him. Because he plays, you know, under his number, his lucky number. And then he plays under, um, we call him Marty, his uh, number. Mm -hmm. And he had a tattoo. My lucky number is 13. And he had like a gambling type cards. Right. With a skull and the number 13 on his shoulder. And my son and I were discussing, well, maybe the number on the card could be 27, which was his lucky number. And, and you could do like a very similar thing in honor of him. Um, but yeah, I think I would get, I don't know, something Egyptian, really. I, I really love uh, Egyptian culture and, and the, the history. I love history. Uh -huh. And um, I think there's something to it energetically. So in the eye of Horus, very interesting fact is it is in the brain. Um, if you look at the penal gland, I believe it is, mm -hmm. it looks just like the eye of Horus. So it, it's kind of ingrained in us, you know, but it's, I don't know, there's some significance and I just, it's a vibe, but I think, 
I wear a lot of shoulderless things, so mm -hmm. it it would have to be in a private area that only like a significant other would see. Um, I don't know, or yeah, I don't know. Where, where like where it where was your first tattoo? My first tattoo uh, I got when I was seventeen, and it is like inside my hip bone. Oh, so like it was, the yep, front? Yep, yep. Because um, I had the same train of thought as far as I did not want it to be visible. Um, I did not tell my parents about it uh, for a really long time. Um, they probably knew. Who knows? I, my mom will watch this, so she'll let me know when she knew about it. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so that was my first one. And uh, but now, like, um, I have them on my arms. Um, my legs, they're, they're everywhere, but my face and neck, more or less. Well, and I want to, because you mentioned the face and neck tattoos, I have, I have just a small story to share about that. Um, my neighbor upstairs, because I, I have two thirds of the house and, and him and his wife and kids have the upstairs. Mm -hmm. Um, and he is tatted, right? But it's funny because, like, I really don't, I'm from uptown New Orleans, so you have to be pretty impressive to be weird. Right, right. There. I mean, I've seen a lot of things, tattoos, you name it. And so I really, I always just talk to people. You never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And we've had this discussion, me and him, because he's got tattoos on his neck. And he said to me, he's like, you know, people look at me like I'm a drug dealer or I'm I'm a criminal or whatever. And I'm like, okay. He's like, but I have tattoos on my neck, so I get that. So he's aware of what right, right stereotype is in the respect of that people who have been in prison have tattoos in those areas. And so he was like, I didn't think you were going to talk to me. Now his wife is Puerto Rican. She's in incredible but she's she's very reserved and so for a while for the first six months I really only spoke to him as I was coming and going mm -hmm. right and you know it, he's the nicest guy on the planet literally he watches out for my son oh I saw your son in town you know did you know he was out at this time or whatever right so he's got my back and hopefully my son doesn't listen to this because <laughs> he doesn't know that, my, that our neighbor kind of like when he sees him lets me know um who he's with or what he's doing and it's like you know we're really tight-knit in my neighborhood that way but yeah and he was like you know people judge him all day long and then when they speak to him uh -huh. they change their entire reference point like they're like whoa you're a nice guy you know so I always try to give people that even look ominous a chance now some ominous people are just ominous right and some really really clean cut you know regular middle middle of the road vanilla joes are very ominous hmm. after they talk to you yeah so that's why it's kind of like i just every person individually you know and but he tells me about the discrimination just because of his tattoos or the color of his skin or or whatever but then if, when when people give him a chance, because usually it's the same people mm -hmm. approaching him, then they they're nice to him. They leave him alone because they realize who he is. He's well spoken. He's a nice guy. And you know, I've gotten to know his wife over time too, and we talk about it because she's Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. I believe. And you know, her and their interracial relationship and the discrimination that goes from there, which I've experienced because. My kid's father is not from this, you know, he's first generation. here. So, um, you know, it's, it's just talking to people and finding that relatable yes. thing because he gave me perspective. Now, when I walk into 7-Eleven and there's this really heavily bearded, you know, tattooed dude, I'm like, Hey, uh, what do you think of this? Or, you know, Oh, excuse me. You know, not like. He might be a teddy bear. Right. Exactly. Or he could be a serial killer. Right. You know, just, 
But you won't know until you at least speak to him him. in a public place where you're protected, more or less. Yes. I mean, I wouldn't go in the dark alley to get to know someone. Anyone. (laughs) Tattoos or not. Tattoos Tattoos or not. um, (laughs) Even if they're smaller than me, because why are they inviting me into a dark alley? Right. You know, context is important. I have questions. Exactly. So... Where can people find you? So if they are loving you as much as I am and Uh need some Vivica positivity in their life, or they want you to go get their belly button pierced with them, where can they find you? Um, Well, I'm on Instagram and it's under Gus, G-U-S dot Samarium, S-A-M-A-R-I-U-M. And those are my middle names, actually. Gus is short for Giuseppe. And when I got divorced, I put Samarium in my name because I'm nerdy and science loving. And uh, that's periodic element number 62. Okay. Okay. So it's a whole nother story. I love it. I love it. But yeah, so Gus.Samarium on Instagram. Awesome. You've been amazing today. I so appreciate you. Oh, I appreciate you too. I, you know, for my first time, it was like, I wouldn't have wanted to do it with anybody else. Oh, thanks. (laughs) If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and follow us on social media so you'll never miss what's going on. Remember, until next week, you are strong enough and you are worth it. Thank you for listening to the Strong Enough Podcast. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform by searching Strong Enough. And on YouTube, we're on the Spear Talk channel. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Strong Enough Pod. If you have suggestions for an upcoming episode or a future guest, please reach out at strongenoughpod at gmail.com. Remember, you are worth it.